is a scourge is to ask you really how you got into this whole magical, wonderful world that I was to. Well, I was a Franciscan at the time, but I think um, I was I was not planning to go on to the Franciscans. I had an opportunity to go to Arizona to teach. And the principal of the school would teach us summer schools, sessions. So when he came to teach us that summer before graduation, I said, you know, I'm not going to go on, but I'm still in order. Um, how about if I go to Arizona and teach you until I'm out of my house? And he said, how many of I would love that? And I think the Indians would love you. It would be great. So I went to Arizona to teach biology and English at Ultimate Science. What year are we talking about? At 1963. Okay, okay. August of uh, 63, I went off to the desert. And I, since I was a kid, I wanted to go to the desert. The desert was the thing. I had every issue of Desert Magazine and Arizona Highways since I was able to buy them probably in the fifth grade. Uh -huh. I think in the fifth grade is when I joined the Cactus and Supplement Society of America. <laughs> Scraped together three dollars and fifty cents. I don't know where I got it, but dude, I just wanted to go to Arizona and teach and I wanted to work with Indians and there was my dream come true. You wanted to work with Indians. What? Was that because the Indians desert was all connected to yeah, it was and I I just that was part of the dream I guess. Yeah. And so here it was coming true. Arizona in August and September was a teaching and uh, I taught one year there. I was doing my archaeological work, so what ultimately became my dissertation. Uh, and uh, oh, this is this is great. I've been doing a lot of ornithological data, it's new stuff. Birds of Arizona was just going to be coming out. Contacted one of the authors and he said, Oh, yeah, I'm going to hold this up. I'm going to insert some things in the press of some of the records that you, you uh, made. And so, the last minute, before, I, before my bird records got from the birds of Arizona. So, that was a surprise. But see, I was doing, I was coming as a scientist and as a teacher, and one of the authors of Birds of Arizona wrote to me and said, I'm going why don't you find out what those old Indians know about the Gila River before it went into that? Because it, been, you know, it was a major river in southern Arizona. It was a destroyed river. It was no longer a river. Find out. Well, that was in 64, 65. And I started asking people. Okay, hold on. So, you got there in 63. 63? 63, 64. You hadn't been a teacher formally before. Oh, no. You're just all of a sudden teaching biology, mm -hmm. community, members. and English. Kids who had, who had just learned English when they started school, every all my kids started started uh, knowing their own language. I taught Apaches, Navajos, Mescalero Apache, White Mountain Apache, and lots of Pima Apache because I was a Pima Apache whole country. So they were all coming they were to coming school? the school. Yes. It was a whole school. Who was running the board? Okay. And, okay, so you're just faced with language, like right away, you're initially. Oh, yes. Well, I was, I was, it was a great learning curve. You know, the kids like me, and I like the kids. And we just sort of hit it off. And it was, it was, it was a lot of fun. And I said, you know, there's got to be a different way of teaching. They just don't take the books so much. Uh, but, they love skin birds. I thought about how skin birds was the next specimen. This is the data. And so we sort of did things that way. And I also found out, and this was, I think this was a big breakthrough among the teaching sciences. Um, I found out they were all good artists. The boys, especially, were good artists. But the girls were good artists, too. Is that an observational thing? What is that? Well, I don't know. But I said, well, my approach to teaching better be through getting these kids to draw, taking them out in the field, and we'll draw these plants, we'll draw these birds, we'll draw these charts, we'll draw everything. And so it was, it was, I think it was something to do with the language barrier that drawing work. Some of my students became professional artists, and they had famous names like Chicago and Jack yeah. Curran and so forth. They exhibited in San Francisco and all of this. But it was a good 
he was a good fit for uh, an approach, a pedagogical approach to teaching science. Were you living at the school? Oh, yes. yes. Okay, so you were mostly your day to day contact was with kiddos. Yes. Of what age? Up to high. Well, I taught most of the sophomores in high school, so all high school. Okay. How, how, when did you start to go beyond kids and families? Like, right away. Right away. I, I started meeting uh, people. It was interesting because for some reason, some people come to school and Indians didn't because they really didn't talk to me. And for some reason they talked to me. I don't know what it was. I know. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and my principal said, you know, this is, this is weird because Indians never talk to strangers, mm -hmm. but they talk to you. Mm -hmm. Well, about the next year that I was teaching, Alan Phillips, who was the dean of Arizona Ornithology, he was working in Arizona at that time. He said, find out about what you do. If you need to tell anything about the birds and the wildlife and the ecology before the river went down. So that started. Uh, I started asking the gardener, the local gardener, actually, the, through the years he played by, he was one of my main consultants. But it spread to, you know, other people in that generation, his generation. So I was dealing with people who were born in the early 1900s. Oh, yeah. And they knew about, there was a river. They knew about swimming in the river. They knew about fishing in the river. You know, well, there's a puddle in the river after a rain, but no river. And there hadn't been a river for 30 years or so. They still knew about this. At that point, was it, was it part of common discussions, or was it just because it had been a while already for them? And and so we're having to, I guess I asked him a question for evoking all these memories of probably People love to talk about yeah. what things were like. And I think that people appreciate it. Old people really appreciate when somebody had the interest to find out about these things. Yeah. And so it just sort of opened. I became the, the oh, what would you say? The blank notebook yeah. that they could write on. And eventually the voice. And the voice. Yeah, yeah. So that was like three years after Alan Phillips called you and said, start this? Well, I started the next year or so. Oh, okay. You know. So it really, was, you it was, it was don't Right away. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you come, you go to a group of people and you think you're bringing them something. Yeah. And after three <laughs> years, after three years, I said, I'm the one who's going. They're the ones that are teaching. But what they know is not being passed on. And they have a lot to pass on to future generations. But those generations at this point don't appreciate what, what they need to learn and uh, aren't ready for it. But someday they will be ready for it. Yeah. But um, I, I said, oh, I'll, I regret, you know, I look back and I, there were people who were really, really old at that time. And he didn't work with those people. I didn't know the questions to ask. I didn't know what riches that I had just fallen into, you know, this gold mine of information. But there were people there who had seen the covered wagons coming across to California, you know, and they were they were by in the 1880s and 1890s, and, and you know, they were in their, you know, they were old. But none of those people I didn't break the ice. Every once in a while, the people who were born in 1910 would say, I'd ask a question, and say, I always have to ask the old people. They would consider themselves the old people. And they would. And they'd come back with this, yeah, we didn't do that, or we did do that, or this is how we did that. This is all in English, right? This is all in English. And you spoke, you said English was a second language? Yes, yes. Everyone I worked with at that stage knew what we were done in All those people. Are you comfortable? I think very well. Yes, you can sort of tell from the books because when I when I quote people, I like to quote people yeah. and say what they said. Yeah, what I think they said. Part of your book. Yes, what they what they said, not what I filter through. Yeah. What I think they said, yeah. or what I think they meant, or summarizing things. Let them talk. You know, yeah. Put it in there. And so I, I, I said, you know, this is this is their English. I know that it's a Maybe I have to put something in case you were not uh, being understood. It's their, their speaking. So, um, 
that's that's another one. So you were dealing with folks who weren't the oldest oldest. No, they weren't the oldest oldest. But still the generation of folks you were working with still still that knowledge was still They were they had grown up as subsistence farmers yeah. and many of them were still largely subsistence farmers and cattle people. Yeah. Um, Hunting had declined a lot, but most of the you know, one time when I got down to writing my mail or getting the information from an mail book, I went to each person and I asked them a question that really blew me away. I said, when did you, what did you hunt with when you were a kid? And he said, oh, well, no, of course. I said, didn't you use a rifle? Oh, no, I didn't have rifles yet. Every single one of my consultants said, oh, no, I didn't have a rifle until I was 20 or so. Amazing. Yes. Amazing. Yes. So when you're... And this is just a... Oh, 15, 20 miles outside of Phoenix. Oh. <laughs> so, paint the picture for me and for people who will be listening to this and for emerging ethnobiologists. You make it sound so easy, and part of it was easy because of who you are, because you're so likable and so. Thank you. <laughs> you are and intelligent. And you're My good. enemies don't say that. Well, we don't talk to them. And you're a good listener. I think that indigenous people should know that and know that. I think that you just said something really important is being a good listener, just being able to ask the question, and even if, well, I'll tell a story. <laughs> Takashi, my partner, came to uh, Arizona with me on Christmas, and I asked an old man, who's now dead, um, I asked him a question. Takashi said, but it's cold in the little town in Phoenix. Take, take, take my pictures with these things. I went to town. So he went to town and he came back and Joe Giff was still talking. And you shouldn't, you shouldn't tire him out. It's been a long time. You shouldn't tire him out. He's still answering the question that I asked him before he left. I love it. And this was his thing. He could talk about a professor and he had all this breadth of things. But you know, you ask the question. And you better be ready for a two hour or a two and a half hour or a three hour answer. This happened. One time I went into this, I went into this village in the other end of the reservation. And the fellow was, I taught his daughter and his son in high school. And I real cattle, and there's dumb cattle all of a sudden. And I went and I asked the son, started to ask him, can I, can I interview you today? <laughs> He just fried his eggs on the stove, and they were sitting there, two fried eggs on the stove. He said, yeah, let's talk. And he did the paper burger, we'll talk. <laughs> we talked, we talked. It came about 10 o'clock. This is, this is at least 7 o'clock in the morning. It came about 10 o'clock. I said, Leonard, you're, 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 that's okay, this is more important. He got to be lunchtime, and I was getting hungry. The eggs were still sitting in the frying pan. I said, well, you know, maybe you, I have to keep you, maybe you should eat your eggs. No, we need to get, we need to get through this. <laughs> and I tape recorded it for hours. All I did was get changing the tapes and he kept talking. Wonderful stuff. Wonderful stuff. So that says to me, so you gave people a voice, mm -hmm. but at that time, at that moment, um, it sounds like the knowledge transmission, it was kind of halted temporarily, that it wasn't being it was not. Exactly. I and mean, I think that's, that's still true. Still true. Uh, but it's beginning to turn around uh, somewhat. And I'm finding that um, educators on the reservation are taking my books and developing, developing uh, talks and educational. Uh, Powerpoints yeah. with my books. <laughs> yeah, PowerPoint <laughs> yeah, the PowerPoints which I don't use, but being a real Luddite. <laughs> but they're PowerPoints and pictures and key things and yeah. like workbooks with yeah. this bird says this, or what is this bird called, or what color is this bird in, you know, the card mode and, and, yeah. and this is how you say it. You know. So that is but I started working also with the Tomahawk, the people that I lived with, the Akimahawk, the River, the Levin, the Tomahawk, and also, where there's a lot more information. People are more out, people are doing more subsistence activities. And I worked in 
Jesus Christ for you, seven, eight hundred days. And here's what was left in the hospital on the river of Rocky. And there were two speakers at that time. And they worked with them for 12 years until they died. And uh, was, but it was such it was such a shock to me when two speakers died in this language was gone. And they were 12 years. And they go down every chance we could get. Here we go, three times here. And I'm bringing Dina down from the United States to work with them. And uh, I didn't go back to that village in years. It was, years. it was just too much of an emotional thing to go back to say, okay, um, there's no there, there are people who are there. Dina, I would say that. I also worked with Mountain King. And wherever I went with Mountain King, they were the same. They were the most open, I got lost, the first time I went up, I got lost. And I was going through this, this sort of rancher, dispersed rancheria thing. And I got lost and I heard people talking in some courtyard or some house. And I said, well, I'm looking for so-and-so, where are they? He said, oh, I, who are you looking for? And I said, well, it's so-and-so. There are a lot of people have that same thing. And so I said, well, I'll just sit down and have some coffee and they'll show up. Don't worry about it. And this was total strangers of Pima's. And just, just a little visit. <laughs> Can you paint for me the, the landscape of the Mountain Pima? The Mountain Pima are kind of buildings. And that's why they're not in my mountain. Well, they're a little bit in my mountain book, but they're not in my book. Because I like to read that as a second book. It's a different, it's really a different language. It's been separated from the lowland people for probably about a thousand years. The lowland people have a hard time understanding the Sierra Pima's. And the words are all So I would like to do that. It's one of the projects that I would like to do. We'll see what happens. But I haven't written the Pina the, the Bajo that's been yet. So I mean, that's a lot of that. So that's one of the things we should do. Let me ask you, because you make it sound so easy. Was, 
psychologically or behaviorally, but what does it mean symbolically and metaphorically for people? And it means it's, it's, it's really esoteric. It's just as complex as everything you could, you could imagine out of Greek mythology. It is there. But getting into that thing and finding out what, this, what that is. And, uh, okay, let's open the door of, of ethnobiology through taxonomy and find out, find out what this what is. And he says like an important too that I think Western scientists miss is the metaphor, mm -hmm. the way of accessing cultural knowledge and the interconnectedness that often is the key metaphor. If you got that, you got that really on. So that says something about you and your whole food. Like that is right? Yeah, so sure. Western sure. folks can miss that. Sure, sure. I, I, I think that's true. Um, I had a little arts background of a major philosophy and a minor in languages of history and English. So I, I think that we've got enough background in mythology and so forth to think in those literary lines. And I think that 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 support. I mean, not gonna be, most scientists aren't going to be that. When I quit, I taught two classes at the University of San Diego. Two of those, by one was origin and myths, and the other one was plant and metaphors. They taught this in undergraduates, and they loved it. And they did lots of readings and they did four groups of interviews themselves. We'll see them and see it. Now we'll catch them and send the Pueblo people and the Granteria people. Um, and so, kids can study this. Let's, let's, read a, let's read a myth of any of these groups, and even compare groups to how they mythologize about a plant, how they plant. How they mythologize about animals. How do they mythologize about paleo? You know, we talk about paleo and paleo is everything's about hallucinogens. But the metaphor, the metaphors involved in that are the, with demons, with demon value, are the same metaphors that came right out of Rachel's song. The songs that go with it. And they probably haven't had a paleo in the century. They still have songs. They still have the connected metaphors about that, you know, the deer, the corn, uh, the third time it's all of these things. Even that far north. So you, you put it under the arts training, which is in jeopardy, I would say, in the university systems and colleges and North America. But well, we have to have computer programs. No? That. Programmers. Yeah. <laughs> and we don't need taxonomists because we have genetics. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but don't you think there's something personal, like your own, like you are, you have, you have your own personal spiritual path, you have a personal spiritual path. Do you sure. think that opens you to the possibility of metaphor and, and, and wonder? Yes, I, 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 I'm sure that was, because I think from the time I was a little kid, I had, I, and I still have that, it's sort of an in, in, intense gut respect for the environment. For plants and animals, and I grew up in a, a ranch in Colorado uh, County, out the country. Went to a lot in school, eight grades, all of this. So, walked two miles to school in the morning and two miles back to the country, and I was always learning plants and animals and so forth. And so, I think I just really bonded psychologically and really bonded to the local environment. Working with other people who are, you know, I, I work with the people that everybody in the tribe, everybody knew every bird that I put in my book, everybody knew every single animal. This wasn't esoteric information. Everybody knew Esau. Esau was a bird. You know, how many people in Phoenix that have Esau, a bird nesting in their backyard in the hollow birdie tree, if they even know the hollow birdie tree? They probably know the hollow birdie tree, it's a state tree. But do they know the Esau? They probably do. It's just a tiny little bird, the size of fish to the world and so forth. But the, every single demon knew it, Hip Papa knew it, and Viva Baba knew it, and they metaphorized about it. They put it in their creation story and, and had these wonderful Esau, for instance, goes to seed very early. It uses its nest in the wintertime. So most birds don't use a nest. And the Esau won't even build nests in the wintertime. Sometimes whole bunches of them live in the nest in the 
Bruce and Cole Rand in, in, together. Uh, in the creation story, when the people were invading the whole kind of area, they had different animal helpers that helped them overcome these above people. And in one Pueblo, they conquered the Pueblo by having a spirit helper, so a shaman and a spirit helper. There were two of them, they were both birds. One was the Isa, and that put the people to bed really, made them sleep and go to bed. The other one, and this is the most beautiful thing, the other one was the poor one, Koro. Because I remember the Koro one. Here is the creation story. The Koro one, now I'm coming, the Koro one meter, the person who had power of the poor one, came in and would just sit down on the ground, and everybody just was ready to go to sleep and see all the air in the economy. Well, the Koro one, the poor one, it's the only bird that we really know now hibernates in the winter. It, it, it's yes. fat, it just lays on the ground, sometimes in a crevice, but sometimes right out on the ground, and goes to sleep all the way. And so the Pima knew this biology, they knew this science, they metaphorized yeah. of it. And that would be a teaching tool for kiddos. Oh, yes. yes. Generation. Sure. So, so, so wonderful. I wanted to ask you. I want to ask if, if it was ever difficult. Like, what were the hard times when working with communities and either personally or was there resistance or were the things you didn't understand? Was it frustrating not knowing the language? Like, what, you know, what were the difficult times? Um, speaking of language, so, uh, sometimes I have interviewed in, in, uh, in the native language. I know enough to be able to ask a question, uh, but I have had work. I have worked occasionally through the How's that been? It's it's not as much. It's not as fluid, fluid yeah. and flexible as yeah, yeah. as the other. But one <laughs> one time I was I was looking for songs for in the desert. I was looking for songs on I think it was um, the Prairie Fire, and I was looking for some. Different shamans. They didn't know this. Well, we had songs to the very high, just the clearing essence. But we don't know. We don't know who lost those songs. Who was the person? The person was too bad. Who lost them. The last person who knew the song. Well, I went to one village that was way out. It took me you know, just to go to that line and see him. It took me all day to get there and back where I was staying in the days. But the man was always, he was always going, oh man, but he was always going out on the roundups or something. And so I went down there and I was interviewing him, and I had a team with me that was bilingual, and uh, he was interviewing me. And he said, I got these songs from me. And he had four songs in him, two of those. He was really confused with this. But, um, and I told Paul, my translator, I said, um, Ask him if he knows any turkey vulture songs. And then I told him, What do you think? I know everything? In English. <laughs> <laughs> he let me go along. All the way along, and never said anything. I found out later he had been in the service. He never said a word in English. Finally, when you ask him for the turkey lunch and sauce, what do you think I know? Everything? That's great. Oh, yeah. he, he enjoyed that. I'm yeah, sure. Totally. He laughed for yes. a long time. He was fast with that. Uh, um, okay. But we were getting back to what was the, the before the language? Oh, well, what, yeah, well, yeah. Was, there, was there resistance? You know, you're asking. That's interesting because, you know, there were people um, who did not want to share information. Yeah. Uh, who were one lady I worked with for years and years uh, said, well, you know, so and so is stingy with this information. I thought he was stingy with information even with his fellow humans. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I didn't, I, didn't, I just didn't bother with those people. I see them and so forth. The community at feasts and mass and so different things, funerals. But I, you know, if they didn't want to share information. And I regret now sometimes I didn't work harder at breaking the ice with some of these, these people who didn't want to share because maybe I don't know. But I have had problems with younger people who no longer know the language and no longer know the information and say, well, 
uh, here's this guy coming here getting, getting all this information and publishing and making money off the books as if you were David and all yeah. that and actually a book. But um, getting all of this stuff, and it's just, this is all supposed to be secret stuff. Well, I always ask people when I'm working with them if I keep the credit song or I keep the credit conversation, so it's okay for me to use it. And also, I always try to bring it back and say, here's the transcription. Do you want to make any changes? And usually they say, no, that's okay. Or there will be something that's unclear. And they say, well, let's verify that. Point. But I always, I try to be always open. But some young people are not, you know, it's, it's this change. Yeah. Now they're using my, <laughs> now they're using my information. Yeah. So, um, not my information, the information yeah. of their great grandparents. So, that's, that's, yeah. so, you also, in addition to working with communities and teaching communities and learning from communities and that work, you also taught about having an academic setting. Yeah. yeah, I was, um, when I went for my PhD, I was the curator of curator groups. That's, that was your Well, at that plus being an ethnobiologist, because um, uh, I was, my formal training was in her tax yeah. and, and I was in the creative position, and when I'm old enough in San Diego, right, this I was finished my PhD, and I defended my thesis and everything, so it worked out very well. But when I was getting together at the PhD committee, I did um, three biologists, Two anthropologists, one archaeologist, uh, Dr. Holly, and a famous archaeologist, Paul Holcomb, and one uh, ethnologist, Bunny uh, Fontana, who worked the farm. So I had them, I had a pretty good committee. I had one theoretical anthropologist in my committee, we had trouble, because I'm not really feeling that at all. <laughs> and, but, but it was always interesting to see the play. For well, why should he take that course? And the anthropologist did it. Well, of course he has to know these courses. Have you chose your committee? Oh, yes. So that's really, that's amazing because already you saw the breadth. Like, that's another hallmark of your career that yes. the anthropologists and the archaeologists who understood not just the interconnectedness of, of ethnobiological knowledge in a given time, but through time. Yeah. As an archaeologist, and yes. you're interested in deep time as well. Right? Well, I did a lot of of, of um, archaeology, bird, mostly bird things. Yeah. 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 And then, of course, that raised questions of the finding bones in the archaeological site. What does this mean to people who really live and who really still tell, tell stories and still sing songs about these organisms as birds in particular? What does this really mean? Why is that? Bones and bones, that kind of stuff. People, but there's a lot of hand southwestern knowledge and, 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 and uh, content. So, oh, well, of course, you know, it's never a puzzle then why those things would be there. It's a puzzle to the archaeologist or the outsider who doesn't know what the knowledge is. Oh, of course, we do these things in the Because, you know, archaeologists can get really. Gets down, it's about bones and stones, and uh, forget the people part. And that's really, again, a hallmark of your career. You know, in the beginning uh, of getting into zoarchaeology, it's the Lynn Hargrave. I met Lynn Hargrave very early. The first ethnobiology conference and the second ethnobiology conference. Uh, of our society. Of our society. And Prescott, we're in honor of Lynn Hargrave. Yep, and right. Steve Inslee yep. um, put, them, put them together. On both programs and fellows and the initial committees, getting everybody together. Thank you. But they were an honor of him. And Lynn was one of those things. He just said, Oh, honey, I was getting off and you know, you're supposed to be an archaeologist. You do archaeology. Right? That doesn't, you don't want to do the ethnography thing, that sort of a pollution. But that was the thing he did that. I know. I mean, his training yeah. was that way. You don't ask somebody about why they use the Lenati. You, you interpret it, you describe it. But that was sort of unorthodox yeah, yeah. or heretical for so. some people. That's not exact. Yes, yeah. yes. Fortunately, that's changed. Yes. I yes. hope. Yes. yes. <laughs> the ethnographic analogy idea was, was heresy. Yeah, that's really true. Sure. 
So that was the society back then. And you keep track of the society through the years? And oh, yes, yeah. I mean, I did the fifth conference in San Diego. I've hunted most of these in the last few years. I couldn't afford to go to all of them. But, so it's good to be back in the world. You know, we have a whole core of people here who have been here since at least the fifth. Kay Fowler and Jan Jan Brooks and, and Gene Anderson and Gene Hunt and I could go on up with the people who've been there at least from the fourth, fifth, not the fourth. So looking at my notes here, there's a question I really wanted to ask you, David Berger, myself. Uh -huh. What's your favorite bird and why? Well, it's funny, I'm really bad at keeping up with the questions. Well, you would need to ask me that. Yes, I have asked you to leave the question, but it's no. Well, real birds each carry. You know the background on that, because it's people who study green birds will always say, real birds eat fish. Well, my comeback is always, real birds eat period. And I, my, my family that I work with is about the uh, converts and vultures, and raise converts. I still have vultures. Yeah, my vultures were hatched in 71 and 72, and they're still going spawn. Well, why do you love that? Because, you know, vultures... Well, they weren't very well studied, for one thing, and people have this reaction. Yeah. You know? And so I guess maybe I, I always talk about the young dog. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> the vultures are wonderful people. I mean, wonderful creatures. And um, Congo was um, almost a uh, So they were, and it was also very interesting. Raptors and the raptors are into all these storks, so that's been something that I've worked on for a long time. Uh, but it's a very interesting thing that humans have two moieties, and the moieties are cultures that people can kind of develop. But if you look at those two animals, I figured I, I would do a book just on this on the whole Pima, Pima concept and what makes up the totality of humanity. Because vultures and having raised vultures myself from the ape, uh, I didn't sit on them, but I uh, <laughs> had a bird in the paper, but, but I've raised them from, from nestlings. And knowing vultures, I've never raised a coyote, but I know enough about coyotes. But this relationship of, you put together the essence of, of vulture and coyote, and you have the totality of the human, human, human person, sort of like the human being type of thing. And I'd like to write that as, as a book with a spin offs of you know, the, the great insight, the philosophical insight that some humans must have had to do this. And you know, the, the vultures and the, the coyotes are always sort of in conflict. It's mostly play, you know, but it's, it's uh, if a coyote man from his clan, my wife marries a vulture, and they, they always sort of use this, only jokingly, because it isn't a marriage prohibition. But they use it jokingly, they say, well, I can't get along with my wife because she's yeah. the opposite. I mean, he, she will say the same thing. But it's just that when the press was doing a uh, Wings in the Desert. Um, they, you know, the press always wants to do the, the cover and all of this. And so they send me the cover and they have this big drawing of Roadrunner. And so that was going to be the next. You know, Roadrunner is a cliche, first of all. Yeah. And I said, you know, I don't think this is acceptable to humans. I said, did you read my Roadrunner account? And the series of Roadrunner songs was initially transcribed in 1903 by Frank Russell, the photographer of the Pumas. He transcribed some of the songs, but he didn't transcribe all of the songs. He left them in Pima and did not put them in. I had them in my book. I translated. I had all of the songs translated. And the Roadrunner is associated with the Muriel disease. And the songs are really interesting because they're sort of, they're sort of brazen. One of, the, one of the songs that didn't get translated, the Roadrunner songs, and these are 
The songs that you use in curing of the universe. So they're, they're curing songs. So one of the songs is about the vagina singing. And she's singing about that she just wants, she just, she's, she just, it's just this joy of what she's going to get. And the other song, we didn't get translated, but it's translated in the book, and the demons there, and the angels is there. The other song is about uh, the, the penis, and he's, and, he's got, and he's got his red head, and he's going to shoot water out of his head, and this is, this is his performance, and this is the Roadrunner song. This is about the Roadrunner. If you look closely at Roadrunner, so you know they have this, this cool thing. Oh, this is, this is beautiful. I, I, I won't go into the whole genitalia that's involved in the Roadrunner metaphor, but I don't think this is the best thing. <laughs> The best yeah. bird to put on the cover when the, the, for, for the peanut, they still, the ones that still remember this. I said, how about the turkey vulture? Because every peanut can relate to turkey yeah. vulture because they're the coyotes or the turkey vulture. So they, they change. And by that same artist that had done the turkey vulture, had done the road runner, so the guy who really wanted to have one of his, his illustrations rather than my, and my illustrations on the cover, says, okay, we'll do that. I like the turkey vulture. So there's a lot behind why those why those things are there. And I can tell you that our family we love the turkey vulture. Oh good. My daughter at 14 wrote a beautiful poem called Old Turkey Vulture, which I will get to you sometime. So another way to connect. Um, you mentioned all these books that you hope to do, uh -huh. and you're currently working on one or two. Working, I'm working on a migration book and I'm also working on two migration books. The rule of all sense of morality and the plant tax on the plant, folk tax on the plant. But I'm working on finishing the rest of the animals. Uh, the fish, the herbs, and the invertebrates. And fortunately, I did the fish early before those people died. The fish, of course, are all gone and have been gone for maybe 50 years. Uh, but people still remember a lot of the fish and the uh, fish tax on the university. Of Arizona was, it was really considered, so you okay, take these specimens, this says, these are the things you should take up and ask them about. So those are my specimens, of that. and I don't know anything about fish, freshwater fish, or any, any of the fish, but I had specimens about that. And I'm glad I did that first because today I couldn't do it, no. but I could still go down and ask people, and probably some sort of this or that lizard. And so the environment so changed. Is there... In Gila River, it's dramatically changed. In Papago, there's been a lot, of, a lot of overgrazing, but they've become sensitive, I think, to the overgrazing issue and on managing at the district level uh, grazing because they, they, they know that there's no So what is the application, is there an application of your work to restoration today? Oh, a great deal. Yeah. Uh, when the PMO wanted to put in a, uh, a section of a mile or so of the river, it's artificial, they pump it back up and, and it runs today. And they've gotten this water source from, from they hadn't even settled their water plants at that time. This, this water the settlement was. Well, what did the old people want? They said, we want to see a river. So they put in about a mile of river. But the company that was putting that, going to put that in, the whole design of that, they got a hold of people. What plants do we put in? What birds do we want to attract? What, what trees are going to go in? What do they do to the people? And what are the ethnographically significant plants that go there? So my, my research has had a lot of practical you know, uh, application. The restoration project. Yeah. See, well, you need this, and if you're going to have these things that the people knew and talked and sang songs about, you need to have this little marsh area and this sort of thing. So, and it happened. You know, a few years after that was done, there was a green heron, and that's a whole taxon. I saw, I saw this one. So, there was a green heron, and there were some cottonwoods that were big enough, and I've had pretty soon green herons were nested in there. Yeah. So you had to do a bit of teaching about ecosystems, probably the people doing restoration, they're thinking of species, put a species here and there, but you're, you're talking about building a whole web. Well, a whole ecosystem, yeah. yeah. 
minor, but, but a mile of river is better than that. And that's success, it works. And it's still running, I think. Yeah, I mean, I know it is. It's still running. You know, so there's mirrors, and there's the areas, and there's the cottonwoods that we show up. I don't think we have any fish in there, but the birds, the things that can come in, have come in.
they just get their degrees and they never hear from them again. What are they doing to help us? And sometimes there's the underlying assumption that the people aren't interested. <clears throat> the people are interested. It's just that they haven't really built their bridges. The scientists haven't built their bridges. I think, in the communities. But that varies. There, there are wonderful examples and poor examples. I think some of the countries in Latin America make that an absolute prerequisite in studies. When you go in, some of the to people are doing the same things. Okay, what good is this for us? What are you bringing us? What do we have left for you? That's a really good place to end it and to never why you're doing this and the privilege of doing it. So you bring it back to the community. I'm not going to make money out of it, but. <laughs> <laughs> but we're privileged. Yes. Thank you okay. so much. Dana, thank you.